My name is Keith Bybee, and I direct the Institute for the Study of Judiciary, Politics, and the Media here at Syracuse University. And uh, this spring, IJPM is uh, sponsoring, along with the Carnegie uh, Legal Reporting Program, directed by that man there, Roy Gutterman, the most dangerous man <laughs> on the university campus. Um, <laughs> We jointly sponsor a Law, Politics, and Media speaker series that is associated with Law, Politics, and Media, of course, here at the university. Uh, the aim of this speaker is to bring in um, distinguished academics, practitioners, and experts from around the country uh, to discuss different issues that fall under the general rubric of Law, Politics, and Media. And today we are fortunate enough to have uh, David Rodman. David Rodman is the principal court researcher at the National Center for State Courts, um, where his uh, current research uh, concerns uh, address judicial selection, public opinion of the courts, and the evolution of uh, court structures. Uh, David Robin serves as the NCSC coordinator of the Election Law Program, which is established uh, jointly with the William & Mary Law School. He has a PhD in sociology from uh, University of Illinois at Urbana and is the author of books on community justice, contemporary Ireland, and social inequality. Uh, previously to joining the uh, NCSC, he was on the staff of the Economic and Social Research Institute in Dublin, Ireland, he taught at the University of Connecticut, and at the National University of Ireland. The Irish government appointed him to serve on a committee of inquiry into the prison system and a commission on social welfare. Um, those of you who have been attending this lecture series with some regularity uh, know that we have discussed uh, the role and status of state courts in the United States on several occasions, and few speakers in the nation are better situated to illuminate this topic than David Rappen. The title of his lecture uh, today is Covering, um, Governing State Judiciaries in Challenging Times, A Search for Coherence and Legitimacy. Please join me in welcoming David Rappen. If any of you are Irish, I'll start by saying Slauncha. <laughs> Doesn't look like anyone recognizes the word, so I guess this is a non-Irish uh, establishment. Well, thank you, Keith, for the kind introduction and for the invitation to speak to you as part of this fascinating, eclectic series of lectures. I note that next month you'll be hearing from one of the writers of the television program, Law & Order SVU. While there is some drama in the attempts by the state judiciaries to become coherent branches of state government that can count on public support for their decisions, that struggle does not probably rise to material for a must-see TV series. It is, however, I think, an important story, and one that is not sufficiently appreciated, perhaps, by scholars and media commentators who write and talk about the courts. It is, in many ways, the story of the belated creation of the third branch of state government. I should start by telling you what I am and what I am not going to be talking about. When I talk about coherence, I mean the courts of a particular state being administered in a uniform manner, with procedures and policies that are the same wherever you are in the state and whoever is the judge in your case. It is centralized in how it does its business. So I'm talking about the courts as a branch of state government not about individual judges or courthouses. When I talk about legitimacy, the other part of my subtitle, I refer to the willingness of members of the public to accept judicial decisions, whether those decisions are to their liking or not to their liking. I am not, however, very definitely talking about the federal courts. The state courts are on a very different scale of operations. They decide 100 million cases each year. That's 99% of all trial cases and 85% of all appeals in this country. The majority of American adults have been in a state court as a juror, a litigant, a witness, or something like that. So they have direct knowledge of how the state courts operate, something we don't really have, or very few people have, of the federal courts. The state courts, I would say, are also far more accountable to the public than the federal courts are, and do take steps to demonstrate 
that they are accountable. Particularly now in hard times economically, state courts are trying very hard to be as transparent in what they do and to show uh, concrete evidence that they are in fact doing what they are supposed to do. So my purpose this afternoon is first to tell the story of how early in the last century, a group of leaders of the American legal profession, you might call them an elite, set in motion a court reform agenda that eventually transformed the courts of this country. <coughs> that is a search for coherence. I'll use the state of California to illustrate the magnitude of how much has changed as a result of that agenda. California may not have fulfilled the dreams of its residents, but it certainly did, in a very big way, fulfill the dreams of state court reformers. It's what they wanted, or thought they wanted. But the courts of every state, even New York State, which has a rather more complicated court system, every state was significantly, even if incompletely, transformed into a very different kind of court system, for good and for bad. Once I've described the court reform agenda and how it played out in California, I'll turn to the other search for my title, that for legitimacy. In my view, the court reform agenda started by the legal profession quite a while ago has failed in one of its major objectives. A coherent judiciary, in their view, would promote public satisfaction with the work of the state courts. The most important text of the early court reform movement was an, was an article by a Harvard professor called The Causes of Popular Dissatisfaction with the Administration of Justice. The purpose of the court reform, well there were more than one, but a primary purpose was to make the courts something that the public would respect and that the public would, based on that respect, repay the courts with kind of a, a willingness to obey what the courts do to accept what the courts decide that the courts need. Well, I will use some survey research that I carried out a few years ago for the state of California, their court system, to try to explain why that's the case, why the reform agenda really did not deliver on what might have been one of its most important goals. And I'll conclude with offering some thoughts of my own in terms of what might the courts do, the state courts do now, to try to establish an agenda of reform that might satisfy public needs, or public desires, I should say, rather than needs. Um, so let me start with a brief description of court reform in this, in this country. <coughs> Let me look at the, uh, at first, what the original court reformers of the early 20th century regarded as the causes of popular dissatisfaction. They largely had to do with the structure, the way in which the courts were designed. Well, the rationale for court reform included a number of features. Back in the early 1900s, and going for most of, um, certainly into my lifetime, each judge constituted a court. There was little uniformity from judge to judge, even serving on the same court. They did things to some degree differently than other judges. A particular case can be filled in a multitude of courts, opening the opportunity for people to shop for the judge who one thought would be most favorable to your position. Courts were closely tied in the way they operated to local government, the towns, villages, and cities, and also to them local politics. In many ways, courts were a source of money and of corruption. Uh, many courts were what, what, what one might call a cash register court, the purpose not being so much to administer justice, but to raise revenue for the local government entity that was responsible for the court. Uh, indeed, these days with the recession, a number of states in which the, such local courts that I'm describing have not existed for, um, for, 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 for decades and generations, all of a sudden are thinking of, well, maybe we can set, set up a court of our own as a revenue producer. 
Well, that's not what courts were intended to be, but it's tempting, uh, and it's a successful source of revenue in many cases, but um, that's not what court reformers wanted. <coughs> Judges were also in a very interesting position in that the people who worked in the court did not report to the judges, but reported instead and were employees of a separately elected executive branch official known as the clerk of court. The clerk not only hired the court staff, but controlled the case files as well. So the clerk, not the judge, had control over where the case files were. That was something else that they didn't like. And finally, the judiciary in the United States, at least the state judiciary, lacked the authority to set rules for the conduct of its own business. The authority instead lay in most states with the legislature. Well, court reformers relied on four main strategies to build a state-level judicial branch. To some degree, they all represented conscious attempt to bring the latest ideas from the business world into the organization of state courts. If you know your American history, the period of the early court reform movement was the same as the progressive movement in American politics and life. The desire to improve conditions for the public by uh, reducing the influence of political machines like Tammany Hall, and generally uh, rationalizing the way in which Americans govern themselves. They had a couple of their four main strategies that they used, as I said. The first strategy was to create a single trial court that would hear every kind of case imaginable. So there might be dozens of courts operating separately within a city or part of a city, but in the court reformers' view, they would consolidate all those courts into one court, put a presiding judge, in charge, had administrative rules, and generally have a, a, a judiciary that was, un, that was more visible in terms of the hierarchy of judges. So the difference that this, might, this made in terms of what happened, if you go back to the 1950s, when I was, when I was born, living in, living in Chicago, that were something like uh, 300 trial courts in the city, within the city limits, 300 different courts. And imagine if you're a citizen trying to navigate which court to go to in which kind of case. It's obviously rather, rather confusing. So now Chicago, and the Cook County, which is the larger county which uh, Chicago resides, has one trial court. And I believe it operates out of something like 12 different locations within the county. Huge amount of, a huge area, huge number of people, one trial court, and all the others, the smaller courts, one judge courts are gone. The second thing that they would do is they would create a centralized management function that would set the policy direction for the entire state judiciary and standardize how things are done. So as a new bureaucracy was going to be created, something the courts lacked because it really was, it was a uh, highest court, the Supreme Court in most states, part of appeals in this state that existed, but it did not have any management functions of any, to, to speak of. So they wanted a bureaucracy that would allow uh, judicial leaders to build something that could actually run the court system on the state level. Uh, that central authority would be responsible for putting together a budget. And instead of dealing with um, many counties and cities and, and, and villages that had their own local government that would, were funding the courts, there'd be one, one budget coming out of the state, out of state revenue not out of uh, not out of local local government, and that way they thought that courts could be taken out of local politics. If there's no money involved, well, local politicians are not going to be terribly interested in doing anything to the courts that they should not be doing. And finally, the courts would take responsibility for setting their own rules. The judiciary would take on would basically run itself. Well, I know this is the most fascinating. Uh, talking about administrative history and administrative matters is not the most fascinating thing. But let me quickly give you an idea about what they thought, the court reformers thought, a state-level judicial branch would look like. <laughs> it would have a state court administrator, a new kind of public official, usually appointed by the uh, highest court in the state, 
and that person would be, in effect, the chief operating board officer of a court system. Just like a corporation has a chief operating officer, courts would have one too. The state chief justice, or chief judge, uh, would devote a lot of their time to management, not just deciding appeals. And they would be, in effect, the chief executive officer, the person in charge of the whole court system. And then there would be either the state uh, highest court would be, or there would be a group of judges who were uh, selected in some kind of manner to be representative, who would make the policy making would make policy decisions for the entire court system. So you can see it's kind of a, something that's going to be very rational. And a lot of this happened. Court uh, state judiciaries did gain substantial control of the administrative rules that they used to organize their work. Legislatures were kind of crowded out of that role, although not completely. And uh, rulemaking allowed Supreme Courts, the state's highest court, a powerful way to get things done. Even in New York State, which has a large number of courts, different types of courts, it gets kind of confusing, uh, the, the chief judge in New York can do many things just by administrative orders. They can, for example, uh, create a, a family court in a place that doesn't have one by taking judges assigned to different, assigned and even elected to different kinds of courts and putting them all together and making them into an integrated family court or criminal court. So you can do a lot uh, if you have your own, your own rulemaking authority. And uh, this is an index of how much has changed. Um, if you ask state chief justices today how much of their time is spent on management responsibilities as opposed to deciding appellate cases, it works out about half of their time, they say, is spent as a manager. So something that would have been unimaginable um, not too long ago. The Chief Justice told that with their job description, they are absolutely aghast and quite possibly would have chosen another way of earning their living. But that's world changes. Um, well, this all happened in the 1970s, more than a half century after the state court reform agenda um, got, got moving. And it's kind of an interesting thing that there was that long a lag between when things started and when actually things happened on the ground. So, um, and the reason for the, why things took off in the 1970s is not that court reformers got smarter uh, or that they got more, uh, more bold in what they were trying to do, but it's really the intervention of the federal government. Back in the late 1960s, early 70s, the federal government poured an enormous amount of money into realizing the state court reform agenda. They wanted to, they, they gave money to establish the kind of organization I work for, which uh, is a national organization uh, established to assist all the state courts in this country and to promote judicial education, to promote case management techniques that sped up the time to, from the time a case started until it was disposed and generally apply modern management principles to the work of the state courts. Well, the federal government was not entirely altruistic in coming up with this money. So every president at one point <coughs> in this country had their own crime commission, back in the days when crime was regarded as the public's greatest problem. And as part of that process, it was realized that police have lots of money, uh, Prisons have lots of money. But there's this group in the middle between when you get arrested and when you end up in prison called the courts. And they really didn't have much money. And it was a concern that courts did not have the capacity to really handle various kinds of situations, and particularly large demonstrations that were not uncharacteristic of that period. So um, this interest, one part of this effort was called the Large Court Capacity Increase Program. So an interest by the federal government in making courts able to handle a larger number of cases, but still, and, and to handle them speedily. So nonetheless, whatever the uh, reasons for the money being spent, and it's now dwindled to almost nothing, uh, but back in those days, it was a lot of money, and the state courts did benefit. And so you saw in the 1970s huge amounts of changes. Well, let me just look at, show you California, to give you an idea about how much has changed. 
you can see the kind of what happened, the coherence of the California court system fairly easily. There was, <coughs> in the 1950s, over 800 courts, different trial courts in the state of California. Now that's down to 58. The rules and procedures followed in the most rural county in California are the same as in LA or San Francisco. There's one trial court that's replicated in each county in the state. The judges in that court, whether they like it or not, handle all kinds of cases, from traffic tickets to toxic torts to felony murder. So it's one bench. Uh, you might guess that there's, there are ways of getting around that, that if you're a, um, what they call a full judge, you're not necessarily uh, uh, presiding over traffic tickets all day. Uh, but that's the, in theory, that's what happened. There's one court. And most of these changes took place fairly recently, in the last 15 years. And what's happened, of course, is if you shut down these local courts, you consolidate them, you bring more and more of the authority to make decisions about the court, court system into the center of the state, which in California isn't really California, in Sacramento, the state capital, but San Francisco, where much of the administrative apparat, apparatus that keeps the state going is located, a lot happened. And so, let me give you an idea about what the um, California court system is like today. First, it's clearly a massive enterprise. It receives 9 million new cases annually. There are nearly 2,000 judges in the state. The state court system has 20,000 employees. 900 of them work for the central court office called the Administrative Office of the Courts, located in San Francisco. And there are 500 court facilities in the state, 58 um, counties, 500 court facilities of one kind or another, they're all owned by the judicial court <coughs> and not by counties or cities that they always have been, it always had been in the past. So every janitor who does, who works in, uh, in buildings that the court, that have court business transacted in them in California is an employee of the, uh, of, of the state judicial branch, even the janitors. So they've taken on any responsibility you can think of, building maintenance, anything you think of, and they made it into a central responsibility and built a rather large bureaucracy uh, to make that happen. The annual budget of the California court system is $4 billion. Well, it's a fairly big enterprise, and you think, well, what kind of policy-making process might support that kind of a system? And um, it's, a, it's a complicated process, and a uh, let me show you a chart that a management consulting firm that advised the California courts, a chart that they produced to try to show how policy making takes place in the California courts. It's um, complicated. It is kind of a, a, an understatement. Um, and it is based on there are strategic plans of six years duration. There's a three-year operational plan. And each year there's an annual review of the progress that's been made in reaching the objectives of the operational plan and the strategic plan. The main decision-making body in all of this is the Judicial Council, which is chaired by the State Chief Justice. And as you can see, it's, it's, a, it's a continuous activity. There is no let-up in this. It's constantly plans are being adjusted and revised. Um, and I have, there with uh, the recession and economic hard times, there has been a bit of a um, uh, kind of a backlash against the administrative office of the courts and this apparatus, planning apparatus that's up there. Some articles in which individual judges are now publicly speaking out, saying that the judicial, the way the judicial branch is, uh, is run is for the bureaucrats, for the administrators, and not for the judges or, or the public. This was something that would have been inconceivable in California not long ago, because one of the ideas of court reform, court reform and having a consolidated, coherent court system is that there's one voice speaking for the court system, and that's the Chief Justice. No one else is supposed to be saying things. And you have the individual trial court judges leaking information to newspapers, writing op-ed pieces. So it's a rather um, interesting situation that will, how it will end, I do not know, but um, Coherence isn't everyone's liking, perhaps. And 
Well, having seen in California what the search for coherence has led to, California is an extreme, but every state has gone some direction toward that. Every state has a large planning function that it has set up. Uh, every state, in almost in every state, most of the judicial, judicial salaries are paid out of state funds. But it's not complete, but it's been very substantial. Well, let me turn now to what I have called the search for legitimacy. So my assertion is that these changes in the way courts are organized do not really deal with the causes of public dissatisfaction with the way our courts are operate that supposedly started the court reform movement in, in, uh, in, in the first place. Um, it's also, to keep this in perspective, it's always been thought in American history that courts are in more need of public support, of public goodwill, than the other branches of government. That the courts and the Constitution were set up in a weak, as, as weak relative to the other branches, and the only um, uh, resort the courts had was to the public and to the, to the support of the public. Alexander Hamilton stated that uh, in one of the um, Federalist Papers, in a slightly more modern kind of rephrasing of um, of what Hamilton said into uh, 20th century English, was something is expressed in Justice Frankfurter's dissent of some years ago, but capturing this idea that the courts need legitimacy more than the other branches. The court's authority, he said, possessed of neither the purse nor the sword, ultimately rests on sustained public confidence in its moral sanction. Not just confidence, but confidence in the moral sanction of the judiciary. And the newly state judiciaries were certainly very aware that they needed the public's moral sanction. And in fact, they thought perhaps that that's what they were, that what they were delivering. Um, and state courts, from the very going back to the 1970s, started to very aggressively uh, do public opinion surveys. You know, what's the public image? of the way the state, their state courts are operating, and pay close attention to them and try to make reforms that would answer the needs of the public. The main kind of reforms were ones that had to do with making the courts more user-friendly, to take a consumer type of approach to how they dealt with the public. Well, uh, some of these surveys were used to kind of test, and I think ex with the ex test the assumptions of court reformers that a better organized court system would have more legitimacy from the public. And so with high hopes, um, in one case, the organization I worked for in the, uh, in the uh, late 1970s commissioned a very ambitious national opinion survey to measure the public's image of the state courts with the view that what would have to come out would be if you live in a state with a coherent court system, well, the people are going to like it better than, in the, than the court systems of states that have not become more coherent. So they did in the survey, they oversampled, they took more people from six states that seemed to be the real leaders of court reform in the United States. And they picked six other states that were just kind of a mess still in the eyes of court reformers. And they got more respondents than they ordinarily would from, from those states as well. And um, when they tested it and looked, was there any difference in the public, public opinion in those court reform leaders, in those court reform laggard states, there was no difference. Well, this didn't necessarily uh, greatly um, worry court reformers. Someone once said that court reform is not a sport for the short-winded. So they're okay. Uh, there must be something else that we need to do, and we can find uh, a way of really demonstrating what the what the benefits are of uh, court consolidation, making courts more coherent. And basically the reasoning was that well, only if they knew us, they would love us. And that people weren't aware of all the wonderful things these coherent state judicial branches were doing. And so um, they decided on another test. And again, with um, federal government funding, they did a kind of a rather fascinating uh, experiment. This, this was a survey, a set of surveys in a single state, Utah. And the backdrop was, uh, 20 years of court reform in Utah. That really did most of the things that the court reformer, court reform agenda, thought it should do. And what they did was, they, uh, with federal money, they um, hired a journalist 
from one of the main newspapers in Utah. And for a one year period, the reporter took a leave of absence from their job to write a series of in depth articles on issues relating to the courts. Over the same one year period, where these reports would be coming out in the newspapers, television and radio stations aired stories of public service announcements relating to the state's courts, including four documentaries. So there was a public opinion survey in 1990 when all this started, and then a year later in 1991. <coughs> and again, uh, hopes of the reformers were not, were not particularly realized. Uh, there simply was no change in public opinion about the courts in Utah from before and after. Um, this is where my research in um, California comes in, because uh, I think the latest iteration of these efforts to find out, well, what does the public think about us, and how is that related to the way we organize our work, is really to turn to more academic ideas about uh, how the public makes evaluations of organizations you might call our authorities. And that can perhaps tell us why, or tell them why, being uh, efficient is not enough if what you want is to satisfy the public needs and in turn for satisfying those needs have a court, having a court system that truly has the, the support of the public. So I got involved in 2005 in a uh, public opinion survey done by the California court system and I've made that report available on the website for this lecture series for the course and um, we were trying to explain to the California courts why some people have more confidence in the courts than others do. And the key findings, uh, which I'll show in a minute, uh, were from the survey were then tested in a series of focus groups where you bring together 12 or so people, in this case people who have been users of the court, in other words people who have been there for traffic court, small claims court, family court, criminal court, and bring them together with a professional focus group facilitator and have them in their own words, not in the survey questions that I helped devise, where I put words into people's mouths in effect, how people talked about their day in court, what their experiences were. And by and large, in fact more than by and large, they tended to give the same kind of information. People do talk about the courts in the way in which um, the, uh, the survey questions suggested, their responses to survey questions suggested. And the result of that was a introdu introduction into the 2006-2012 uh, strategic plan in the, for the California courts of an objective work to achieve procedural fairness in all types of cases. But well, procedural fairness is not a legal term. And maybe California judges and Californians generally are more receptive to ideas from the social science community. But in a fairly significant way, they adopted ideas that came out of social psychology. It's not legal terms or ideas. They come from social psychology. And uh, I think in the belief that they were not diminishing the preeminent position that due process occupies in evaluating what a good court system is, they set about to try to use procedural fairness as a way of improving the position of the courts, but in particular not just improving how people felt about them, but goes beyond that. The promise of looking at procedural fairness is that people will be more willing to comply with what the court orders. So people will be more likely to uh, pay child support if the court orders them to, more likely to uh, conform to the conditions of probation that a judge uh, lays down, that generally people will see the moral sanction of the courts that Justice Fran Frankfurter referred to, and on that basis be willing to obey the law. And a lot of these ideas are coming from, come from a New York University professor named Tom Tyler, who sat down the basic framework that I'm talking about in a book called Why People Obey the Law. Bottom line for his work is that the American public is more attentive to the process used to reach decisions than to the outcomes of those decisions, which might be a rather shocking proposition in some ways, saying that what people care about when they evaluate what happened to them when they're in court or any kind of situation where they have an authority figure making a decision about them is the process that was followed 
If they think the process was fair, they tend to think the outcome was fair, and they tend to do what the authority figure told them to do. Um, Professor Tyler uses the, firm, um, the term uh, procedural justice. Sometimes he uses procedural fairness. I think justice is kind of a big, a big word, and fairness seems it's a big word too, but not quite as big. It's kind of like the same reason I don't like the uh, <coughs> phrase um, merit selection. You know, think about how judges are selected. There's this one of the systems is called merit selection, which is kind of convenient for the people who, um, who are pushing that idea. So it's the one. It's the it's the approach with merit. But procedural fairness is quite powerful. There's a great deal of social science research that, that, that underlies the proposition that people in making decisions about how they were treated look to the process even more than they do to what the outcome for them was. And let me show you um, some of the uh, Professor Tyler's um, definition of this, which um, I guess you could read for yourself, but that the procedural justice argument is that on the general level, the key concerns that people have about the police and the courts center, center around whether those authorities treat people fairly, recognize citizen rights, treat people with dignity, and care about people's concerns. So if those things are met, um, people tend to be satisfied with what happened. They tend to have support. They have a high regard for the decision maker who uh, treated them in a way that they thought was fair, and also are more likely to do what the court has ordered them to do. Legitimacy, in other words, in the sense that I've been using the word. Well, uh, let me show you two sets of findings uh, from the research that I did. And this is looking at, the question is, how much confidence do you have in the California courts? The, uh, there's. Four, kind, four factors that are up on the screen in front of you. There's whether people felt that they were treated, they perceived that they've been treated uh, fairly in the process that was used. If they feel, felt the outcome, if they're set with the outcome was fair. And then two things that are more kind of instrumental. Uh, in this case, uh, efficiency and the costs of the transaction. So, you're kind of, so the costs and efficiency are the kind of things, I, I would argue, that the court reformers of the early, the early days and continuing today thought was important. But it seems that the public has a somewhat different view, that the uh, bars that go across the, uh, across the uh, screen, the longer the uh, bar, the more important that factor was in explaining how much confidence people have in the court system. So uh, you can see that, particularly for people who've had court experience, and about 60% of American adults have had some direct experience with the courts. Procedural fairness is overwhelmingly important. Uh, it's the same with people who have not been to court, are referring, their reference point is more perhaps newspaper stories, television programs, fictional, and reality. Given that's what their ideas about what the court system is like might come from, and also what they're told by people who have had court experience. But Procedural fairness here is what, what's important. And this has been replicated in dozens and dozens of research projects that are probably more compelling with what I've just presented to you. So um, uh, social psychologists have an explanation for that. They call it group value theory. And that is that people are concerned about how they're perceived, how value, valued a member of a group they are. And so when dealing with an authority figure, they're very sensitive to any kind of signals that might say, are you a valued member of this particular group? Um, so that is one way in which you can explain this. Another way is more practical in terms of if you've been in court, you don't know the law, you don't know the legal system, but you're desperately trying to find out what's going to happen to me, how am I being treated? Well, procedural fa uh, fairness concerns like uh, respect, uh, whether the judge is neutral, where they give me an opportunity to say what I want to say about my case, are things that tell you that this is OK. This is a process that I can trust. And the kind of criteria that people use. I did, um, there's at least one item on my reading I, uh, I suggested that you take a look at. It kind of gives more information about what procedural fairness uh, means. And uh, 
A lot of lawyers in particular look very skeptical at this point. I don't know if any of you are, I guess you have aspiring lawyers here, and maybe a few practicing lawyers. Or, uh, but uh, it does seem that lawyers make a few, view things differently. If you ask lawyers, you try to find out what makes lawyers think, how decide how confident they are in the state court system, lawyers do tend to look more at the fairness of outcomes, which I think is probably is a, is a good thing. But from a judge's perspective, at least those judges who have a law degree, it may explain why uh, both, uh, this may seem a bit strange at first, but when they start thinking about it, it seems that, well, here's what the public thinks. I've been missing something. Well, um, so this idea of procedural fairness, which I've shown you some evidence that works. The more compelling evidence, I think, though, is confidence is nice. It's kind of like people being happy, which is a good thing. But we're really talking here about legitimacy, and that means compliance. The test of legitimacy is that does the person actually do what was decided by the court, or by any authority figure. And uh, the example of um, drunk driving, which is a, um, a kind of crime that is notoriously difficult to, uh, to prevent recidivism. And one of the studies that was done took people who had been in a uh, court proceeding and were sentenced for uh, drunk driving. Those people were questioned about what they experienced and whether they thought it was fair. And uh, if you go back, if you go flash for forward to four years later, a long time after that court experience, you can ask, you can then look at, well, who were the recidivists? And the people who said that, the offenders who said that they had experienced a fair process had 25%, one quarter of the recidivism rate of the people who said that they had not had a fair process. So it does seem that people, uh, and there are many other studies like this, that people remember what happened to them in court, and they use that information if they have been to court. That's the basis on which they make decisions about um, what they think about the courts. And whether people feel that they were treated in a procedurally fair manner makes an enormous amount of difference in terms of what happens after they leave court. Even four years later, you can see the effect of whether a process was seen as procedurally fair or not procedurally fair. Well, uh, let me turn a bit to what I have in mind in terms of what, what should be the, uh, what kind of court reform agenda do we need at this point? And uh, I think, to me, procedural fairness does offer a good, solid basis for looking at how to reform our courts. Uh, and there are some models in some, in some states that have used this idea of procedural fairness over a period of time. But uh, and the kind of things I have in mind are, uh, let me just show you quickly from, this is a uh, trial court in Minneapolis. It's the only court in Minneapolis, indeed in Hennepin, Hennepin <coughs> County, where the uh, court is located. And this is what they do. They have fairness studies designed by Tom Tyler, who I mentioned as kind of the godfather of procedural fairness, and several other uh, social psychologists who specialize in it. And every judge, from time to time, is, they're, they're, is evaluated on the basis of what people who leave their courtroom have to say about the judge. And it's not just how they like, but it does include things like if you are a defendant in a criminal case and are found guilty and sentenced, when you leave the courtroom, do you understand what you're supposed to do? The conditions of your probation order, what the civil protection order means, that's what's been given, not the criminal case, but civil protection order. And a judge is held accountable for whether the whether defendants know that or not. I think in most places it would be thought that's the lawyer's job. Their lawyer should be the one who passes on the news. But the court, because of procedural fairness concerns, they feel that the judge should ensure that when someone leaves their court, the person knows what's supposed to happen. The kinds of questions that people are asked about a judge, this is some examples. Things like, I understand what is required of me in order to comply with the judicial officer's decision. 
but the judicial officer seemed to be a caring person. Um, I don't think Judge Judy would do all that well on that, but uh, she doesn't live in Minneapolis, so it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. But these are kind of things that a judge, and this is something that a judge is held accountable for. In other states like Utah, it's an entire court system that's held accountable. If you go to the Utah court's uh, webpage, you can find the, uh, the procedural fairness ratings of every court in the state. So it's available as public information. And I think out of this, one can forge a fairly good idea of a court reform agenda that is uh, aimed at producing legitimacy of doing the kinds of things that uh, are conducive to believing the court or people hearing about the court and deciding that it is fair and that there is a moral reason to do what the court has asked. Well, let me conclude. This is my kind of idea, and I've been preaching it to judges uh, with some regularity, with some degree of interest on their part in hearing about it. But I'll conclude with kind of some concerns that really were crystallized today. Maybe it's being on a university campus, we start thinking again, something maybe I haven't done since I left graduate school, but all of a sudden some things became a bit clearer. And that is, well, something other people have pointed out first, that procedural fairness is a two-edged, double-edged sword in some respects. That if you, uh, if you can use these kinds of criteria to set up a process that people think is fair, we can probably get away with a lot of unfairness unnoticed. And so you can kind of have what you might say a false, a false consciousness that the courts are fair, even when perhaps they are not administering fair justice. And the other thing is that going back to my, me uh, going back to my graduate school, school days, I, I remember uh, reading something by a uh, professor named Amitai Etzioni, who pointed out, in looking at, at organizations, things that are easily measured tend to be the things that are produced. If police officers are judged on how many arrests they make, or how many traffic tickets they, uh, they give out, then you'll get a lot of traffic tickets and a lot of arrests. Well, so what's easily measured tends to have a lot of it uh, produced by any organization, including a court. Well, this wouldn't bother me as much if there were good measures of due process. If we could also say, here's a judge, you're, you're a judge, you're accountable for uh, due process in a way that can be easily measured. It is measured, obviously, by appellate courts, by judicial discipline bodies, all kinds of different ways. But um, that's, uh, so I, maybe I'm not quite the true believer I started with. I'm sure by tomorrow, I'll get back to that. But I think it's, just, it's worthwhile pointing out that there's no such thing as a, uh, a free lunch or a social science-based reform agenda that has no, uh, no possible down, downside to it. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you, and I welcome any questions that you might have. Please feel free to raise your hand, David. Feel free to call on people. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Between due process and procedural fairness? I, I can't think of a specific study, but I think generally you can say that people, due process does not, you have to go a lot further than that in terms of making people understand what you mean by that. I think, in fact, I would think a lot of people would actually think if you say due process, they'd probably come up with procedural fairness types of uh, considerations. I yeah. So I don't think you can't. Um, I, I would not think so. I think that if they have a lawyer, the lawyer should be doing that. If they don't have a lawyer, then somebody, a legal profession, somebody should be watching out for that. But no, I don't think that's clear. Yeah, please. Do you think the media has an impact on the public's perception of procedural fairness? And, uh, do you have any uh, idea on what relationship the media should have with the courts? It's something, it's something that's interesting to start off with is that um, if you talk to people who've had court experience and look at their, their opinions about the courts, well, what matters is whether they felt they were treated procedurally fairly and whether the outcome was fair. That's all they care about. 
if you talk to people who do not have that direct experience in courts, they tend to be highly influenced by their political identification, by their exposure to media, the kinds of programs they watch. They watch a lot of reality TV programs, if they see Law and Order a lot. Uh, that tends to influence their, their, their thinking. But if you've been to court, that's what people focus on, and apparently even after long periods of time. Um, I think that um, the most interesting things I've come across in talking about the relationship between the courts and the public and the media kind of is in between, is that um, it's a uh, no-win game for the courts trying to use the media as the messenger to the public. That the media has its own agenda, it tends to engage in what this particular um, author referred to as a discourse of disrespect in relation to the courts, and that judges have to take more of an effort to speak out themselves and address the public directly. That's not easy to do, but um, that's, so most court systems these days have a public information officer, and their job is to help the media cover the courts. It's becoming more and more of a challenge because there aren't many court reporters left in this country. If somebody who's assigned probably the new person in the, uh, in the newsroom goes out to the courts and covers them for a period of time until somebody replaces them. So it's not the kind of the old-time court reporters who are covering the courts for a long period of time you really understand it. That's not around, I don't think, anymore. So the kind of things my organization does is we I've helped develop an online course for judges and how they can write their opinions and orders in a way that, uh, particularly in controversial cases, that explain what the role of the courts is in a case, why the dispute has come to the courts, and what the courts did, what kind of logic the courts follow. And that seems to be something that like, has some kind of promise that when, it, when courts make a decision that's going to get a lot of attention, they have the obligation to explain what they did. And I think the U.S. Supreme Court was terrible at that. The worst example was the Kelo decision, which some of you may have heard about, which had to do with um, taking of, of uh, private citizen's property for, a, for a, uh, economic development. But the court just... Um, they're terrible. If you look at it in terms of procedural fairness, they kind of they failed uh, very badly. Uh, so I think judges need to do a better job, and media can perhaps help, but it's not, courts can't, like the Utah experiment. You can have all the positive stories, fluff pieces, fluff pieces that you want. I don't think it's going to change many people's minds. Yeah, please. Um, with that, uh, with Social problems. That um, well, it's a good. Que it's a very good question. It comes up, I think, particularly now in terms of what they call problem-solving courts, like drug courts, which you may have heard of, where um, it's still a courtroom, but the court undertakes to try to help people. So in this case, the social problem is that people commit crimes because they're poor, because they're drug addicts, and the court should take a role in, in this this philosophy in trying to get people the help that will prevent them from coming back to court again and again and again. And that's rather, it's kind of con it's controversial. It, it's been something that's happened a lot. There are a lot of these kinds of they call problem solving courts, drug courts, um, and uh, there's um, housing, uh, homeless courts, mental health courts, but it is going pretty far away from the um, judicial role that we've always understood it. But we, what we do know is that um, Defendants seem to respond very positively to that, to having this kind of a social problem-solving role for judges. And that would explain why, to the extent that drug courts, mental health courts, have a better track record in, in, in having uh, lower recidivism rates, it's because they do communicate uh, that kind of fairness. And I know from some public opinion survey work that I've done, not of court defendants, but of the public at large, you give people the ideas of what should judges be involved in social, social, solving social problems, like um, having medical doctors and psychiatrists advise them on what to do to refer people to um, various social services. The public loves that. And the groups that are most disenchanted, least, uh, uh, least in favor of the courts, give it the lowest legitimacy, are the groups that just like that the most. I think there is a sense that people do want courts to do that. 
whether they should or not, should not, I don't, it isn't resolved by public opinion. Yeah, Keith. I was wondering about, I, I'm intrigued by this idea about having training judges to write better opinions. A lot of the procedural fairness seems to be based on being in court. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's the case that opinions can be written in a way that they mimic some of the effects of procedural fairness so, and therefore mitigate some of the uh, negative opinions? Of course, you mentioned one of the reasons that people are politically conservative mm -hmm. have a lower estimation of the courts. Mm -hmm. So that in that trumps, and for, for someone who had no experience in court, that's what they're referring to. Or many people think that African Americans are treated less favorably by the courts. Mm -hmm. In fact, it seems like every all different groups agree, including oh, yeah. African Americans themselves. Oh, yeah. um, so, do you think it's possible that opinions can be written in such a way so that we don't have to rely on everybody being moved through court, either as a defendant or mm -hmm. as a victim or as a jury member, uh, so that procedural mm -hmm. fairness can just kind of work its magic across the board? Well, in terms of magic, I think you can't. An appellate opinion can do a couple of different things, and obviously. You can't get away from you know, the media is going to filter what is said in an opinion. People are not going to sit down and read a 40-page court opinion. But you can do things. One of the elements of procedural fairness is giving people voice, which really amounts to making let, let them know that they were heard. Well, a court decision, when you write the opinion, you can make clear. You can express, you can explain, but here's the arguments that we received. Uh, you can also be careful, and this is something if you look at judges' opinions, people have done this uh, empirically, that respect is often one-sided. That the courts, if you look at how they treat one side of the case, the winning side of the case, it's very different. That there's a disrespect for the losing side and respect that comes through for, for the winning side. So I think it, and, and I, so I think that yes, you can, you can teach a judge to write a procedurally fair uh, appellate opinion or a court order. Um, and there are some examples where that has been done with. Um, a lot of public dissatisfaction over a, a, a decision by the courts is how they turn, turn around. In some cases, the judge actually, uh, I don't know if an appellate judge do it, but a trial court judge going on television to explain what they did in, in a case. I think it, it can be done. I don't how effective it is given people's, all the competing demands on people's time and, and attention. Uh, but I think it, it's, whether it's, it helps or not, judges sh should be doing that. If they work for the public, they should be addressing the public in a way that the public can at least understand. And uh, a couple of interesting examples of uh, cases which judges seem to do that and uh, uh, kind of um, at least make people think twice about what the court had decided. I think it's particularly important to explain how disputes get to a court, something courts don't really do, that the courts just didn't decide today to make a decision on uh, school funding and issue, issue their their views on that case. I mean, it came to, people brought that case to them with certain expectations of what the court would do. The court was required to hear that case. Uh, it was the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and so that, that, I think that can be done. So do you think, just a brief follow-up, do you think in the absence of that being done, it's something about how the media covers the courts that mm -hmm. leads us to see in public opinion that conservatives or more critical courts or the African-Americans are likely perceived to get short of the stick. Do you think that's a, an artifact of the way that courts are represented oh, no. by the media? Oh, no. I mean, it's I a mean, reality. Yeah. I mean, I go to enough, I, I spend enough time in enough courtrooms in this country to, uh, I'm not trying to be an apologist for state courts. I know what goes on, and I know what, what people see uh, in terms of, there's a lot more than that. You can't blame the media, I don't think, for much of anything. I don't think um, judges should. Think. But I think relying on the media, <laughs> relying on the media, is, is I think is a mistake for judges. It okay. uh, does not it does mean you stop trying. But this idea that the media is somehow going to do your bidding, that's not what the media is supposed to be doing. It's not supposed to be making people feel good about their judges. It's supposed to be reporting the news, and uh, they report the news that leads and uh, gets on gets the lead story. They're not going to report on this judge today did this in a case where everyone walked away happy. And it's just, they can, you can get the worst. The courts I mean, always like turn up more or less at their worst in, in, in the media. And that's maybe the way it should be. That's what uh, reporters pay attention to. And that's their job. But I, don't, I think there's, I, this, this is a, big, a major belief in the court system that if only the media understood us and the public would understand it. I, I don't think it's going to work that way.
very simplistic model. And the people, you know, conservatives aren't unhappy with the courts just because what they see on, on television. It may um, have some influence on that. I can't imagine it's very great. I mean, given all the law and order programs I watch, I mean, I still have some fond thoughts about our state courts. Media, totally media driven, I would probably be very cynical, or more cynical than I am. A good question. We have time for one more question. Yeah, please. I don't have a question, but I'm just glad that you said what you said with regards to the media. I've been saying it for weeks, and I haven't held any <laughs> traction, but I'm so glad you said that. So thank you. I, uh, <laughs> well, it's mutual because you're. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Well, I think we actually oh, sorry. Have, we have an actual question. A real question. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a commer no commercial. That's a nice closing really, question, I just though. I to know if you could give me the website to the fairness tests that you put on the presentation. Um, they're um, probably. If you have very good eyesight, you should be able to. I can give you this. This should uh, take it. Thank you. The court's, the court's name. And I think you should see the address. There's um, this is from Minnesota Courts, Fourth Judicial District, and there should be uh, the fairness studies. If you can't, um, uh, ask uh, Keith or someone. Who, I, I, I can send you the web link. Well, I, yes. When the courts make decisions on gay marriage and issues like that, yeah, um, that's uh, it, it certainly has happened, and uh, recently with gay marriage decisions in Iowa, Massachusetts, and quite a number of other other states, uh, there is a lot of interest in well, if courts do that, what happens? And the argument I would make is that if a court has legitimacy in the eyes of the public, and the public might be disappointed. A conservative might say, why are the judges doing that? It's none of their business. They're legislating. But over time, that should that feeling should fade away a bit, and their overriding kind of overall respect for the courts would, uh, would take over. And that's kind of the importance of legitimacy, it's because it's not just people who are happy with you. Uh, that, that, um, it's understanding that people can be very unhappy with what you do, but still believe that you have the right to make that decision, that the decision should be followed once it's made, and that the courts basically have a, they have a moral sanction to decide those kinds of cases. Uh, and to the most part, I mean, that does seem to work. You know, the U.S. Supreme Court has been the most studied, but you take something like, it wasn't a moral case uh, or a, uh, a morality case, but Bush v. Gore in 2000. I mean, right after that, um, conservatives' opinions of the court shot up, and <laughs> liberals' opinions about the court went down. It wasn't a permanent kind of change, and that's what the courts want. They don't want to please everybody with every decision, but they want people still to accept um, that um, the court had the right to make that decision, and once it's made, it's the law. Now, the issues like gay marriage, it's not, that's, or easily said that because there are people who are going to care very deeply about that issue and will, will use it either to try to defeat the judge in the next election, which is happening in Iowa. There are, I think either three or four Supreme Court justices in Iowa which made a decision favorable to gay marriage. Uh, <coughs> their efforts to this year to knock them off out of their judgeships on the ballot. So we'll see what happens. My guess is that they'll retain their jobs, but. Uh, I don't know for sure. Please join me in thanking David Robinson.